Welcome back. We're in the middle of our discussion of the amendments to the Constitution. You hear a lot about the original intent and the framers, um, but just think for a moment about how significant the amendments are to, to, to your life, to our collective life. Um, think about the Bill of Rights, uh, freedom of speech and freedom of the press, free exercise of religion, uh, right to uh, counsel, and, and so on. Um, those rights are parts of the amendments to the Constitution, not the, found, uh, not the original document. And you might say, well, they're still part of that founding moment, that founding era. Uh, true enough, although even then, note that the very, thing, the very phrase, Bill of Rights, was not the, the phrase that appears uh, in the document itself or that was common um, at the founding period, at least uh, in official references to these early amendments in places like Supreme Court cases. Uh, the Supreme Court doesn't start referring to these early amendments as the Bill of Rights until after the Civil War and because of the Civil War, because during the Civil War and the amendments, the next generation of amendments, people talked a lot about the Bill of Rights and described the early amendments as a Bill of Rights and way more important than, than merely describing them as a Bill of Rights the framers of the 14th Amendment after the Civil War, a much later generation of Americans, insisted that that Bill of Rights apply against state and local governments, what lawyers and judges call incorporation of the Bill of Rights against the states. Remember, the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law abridging free speech and free press. But what happens when states try to shut down free political discourse about, for example, slavery? That's not a hypothetical. That actually happened in America in the antebellum period. Sh sh states tried to shut down uh, political discussion made the crime to be anti-slavery, a member of the Republican Party, put preachers in the pulpit in prison for preaching against slavery. So not just free speech and free press, but free exercise was uh, threatened by um, this regime. When you think today about the most important Bill of Rights cases that, that come to your mind, I suspect you're actually, strictly speaking, not thinking about um, the original Bill of Rights. You're probably thinking about cases involving state and local governments. Uh, you're thinking about New York Times versus Sullivan, or Miranda versus Arizona, or Lawrence versus Texas, Griswold versus Connecticut. None of those, strictly speaking, is a Bill of Rights case. Every one of those is a 14th Amendment case, a case in which a state was uh, claimed to have abridged um, uh, a fundamental freedom of Americans, a state or locality. Now, from the begin at the at the founding, James Madison actually worried that states would misbehave when he actually proposed a Bill of Rights um, or early amendments to the Constitution in the first Congress. He had an amendment that said no state shall, but he didn't get the votes for it because in the wake of the American Revolution, with a lot of states' rights, anti-federalist sentiment, um, uh, um, very powerful at that time, a lot of Americans were fearful of the central government um, and thought they could trust state governments. Remember, the American Revolution was fought by local governments against an imperial center, and the Bill of Rights reflects that American revolutionary, anti-federalist states' rights sentiment. Remember, it begins, Congress shall make no law, and it ends with the Tenth Amendment reaffirming the idea of enumerated powers of the federal government and reserve, reserve powers of, of the state. So the original Bill of Rights, anti-federalist to some extent, protecting rights only against the federal government. Madison wanted more, but he couldn't get it at the founding. But the Reconstruction generation did get it. John Bingham, the, the main drafts person of the key section of the 14th Amendment, was able to accomplish in the 1860s what James Madison, uh, an earlier Congress person, was unable to accomplish in the 1790s. So, so the amendments loom so large for us. If you think the Bill of Rights is important, then um, I suspect that what you really think is important is how the Bill of Rights has come to apply against the states.
because in fact, before the Civil War, even though the, the, these early amendments were on the books, they weren't vigorously enforced by courts. Congress passes a sedition law and courts make it a crime to criticize the federal government. It says, Congress shall make no law abridging free speech, Congress made a uh, freedom of the press, Congress made such a law and courts enforced it. Supreme Court justices put men in prison for criticizing the government. And they, um, um, so the Bill of Rights didn't mean so much on the ground until um, the only the only Bill of Rights case that the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court before the Civil War enforces the Bill of Rights against the federal government, is the preposterous ruling in Dred Scott in 1857 that when Congress prohibits slavery in the territories, when it basically says don't bring your slaves here. If you do, you'll lose them. Keep them out of the territories. You can keep them where they are, but don't bring them into these territories. These territories are free soil. Dred Scott said that law violated the Bill of Rights. That law was unconstitutional. Uh, um, why? Because it, it violated, it was a deprivation of property without due process of law, said the Taney Court. But that's preposterous because the law was passed by Congress and enforced by judges and juries. That is due process of law. That's, that's fair procedure. Um, but the Fifth Amendment says, and the Fifth Amendment surely says due process, and it says the federal government can't violate due process. That phrase comes from England. And England has always had the rule that you can't bring slaves onto English soil, that if you do, you'd forfeit them. That's the land of due process. Due process was always understood as consistent with prohibiting slavery. But that's the only enforcement of the Bill of Rights um, against Congress in the antebellum period, the pre-Civil War period. The Bill of Rights today means a lot. It's, it, it's in a part of every... Americans' daily life and part of your, your consciousness because of cases, basically, much later cases, applying the Bill of Rights against state and local governments. And that's because of the 14th Amendment. Uh, a later generation will put differently. Today, we believe passionately in equality, equality of persons, of black and white, male and female. Uh, Jew and Gentile. The Framers' Constitution did not emphatically embed that equality idea. The Declaration of Independence had lofty language, drafted by a slaveholder, interpreted differently by different people, but not quite binding law. The 14th Amendment puts that word equal in the Constitution in connection with individual equality, equality of all persons. Um, the original Constitution talked about equality of states voting in the Senate. E um, each state gets an equal number of votes, namely two in the Senate, but had nothing about equality of persons. That's a 14th Amendment uh, textual commitment, not a founding era textual commitment. It's all about the amendments. Um, look who's president today, Barack Obama. Barack Obama doesn't get elected president under the founders' rules, which were pro-slavery in some very important ways, advantage the slaveholding South, um, uh, had no guarantee whatsoever that um, uh, people would be allowed to vote equally um, uh, regardless of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. The framers said nothing about equality of voting rights um, uh, regardless of race. The Reconstruction generation, the amenders added that, 15th Amendment. Without that amendment, I think it's just unimaginable that someone like Barack Obama could be present. There's something like the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which we'll talk about in later lectures, could ever pass. So. George Washington is absolutely central to our constitutional vision. We'll talk a lot about Washington's particular constitutional vision in later lectures. In fact, there will be two lectures devoted just to Washington's vision, and he's on the $1 bill, and, 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 and rightly so. Um, and um, he embodies national security and NGO strategy, and he, he is pro-slavery, although um, in that he's a slaveholder and he dies a slaveholder, but he, at the end of his life, is trying to move away from, from slavery. And, and, and that is one of many, many things to be said in favor of the greatness of George Washington. But Washington will give way to Jackson, another general who can beat the British, embodying national security, but now in a much more aggressively pro-slavery way. Washington wanted to end slavery Jack, at the end of his life. Jackson never said anything like that. 
um, much more pro-slavery, puts Roger Tawney on the court. And he is, Jackson is, the most important figure in antebellum America, and he's going to give way eventually, and that system fails to Abe Lincoln. So you got the $1 bill, George Washington, you got the $20 bill, Andy Jackson, but, but the $5 bill, Abe Lincoln, we today live way more in Lincoln's house than in either Washington or Jackson's, or Thomas Jefferson's, James Madison's for that matter. We live in a house that was divided against itself because of slavery, that fell because of slavery, call that the Civil War, that got rebuilt, that house, reconstructed, if you will, by Abraham Lincoln's generation. So we live, I would argue, far more in Lincoln's constitution than, um, uh, than we have understood. Um, that's the generation that rebuilt the Bill of Rights, in effect, and applied it against the states and promised equality, civil equality for all, racial equality, even in the franchise. That's the modern world that we live in, and it's a world of the amenders. So, um, founding fathers, yes, we spent a lot of time talking about their vision. That's what all the early lectures were about, their vision. But I don't want you to forget that our Constitution is an intergenerational project, and you have to take seriously the amendments as well as the original founding vision. Now, in that spirit, uh, in the remainder of this lecture and in the next one, I'm going to talk about the next great wave of amendments. We've talked about the Bill of Rights. We've talked, uh, and uh, the 11th and 12th Amendments at the founding, we've talked about 13, 14, and 15 after the Civil War. Um, now let's talk about the next cluster of amendments, um, uh, especially the 16th, 17th, and 19th Amendments. Now, you may have noticed that the amendments come in these generational spurts or clusters. There's the founding era, um, uh, generating the Declaration of Independence and the original Constitution and, um, and the first 10 amendments and 11 and 12, and then nothing for, fifth, for more than a half century, nothing after the 12th Amendment in, in early in, in, in Jefferson's administration, nothing for a half century. Then this cataclysm of civil war and reconstru reconstruction generating 13, 14, and 15, so the, the next generational spurt then nothing again for another half century, basically. And then another generational spurt, 16, 17, and 19, most importantly. And uh, I'm going to spend the rest of this lecture just making the case that, again, our modern world owes a great deal to the amendments, that the 16th, 17th, and 19th amendments are huge features of your constitutional world today. The founders, a lot of founders said, well, the federal government won't do very much. Um, uh, most of the things will be done by states. And today, the federal government does lots. And some people, some of my friends in the Tea Party think that that's somehow improper, illegitimate, and, and not constitutional. And I say to my friends in the Tea Party, well, take another look, because it's not, the Constitution isn't just the founding. It's a series of Amendments, and the amendments are nationalizing amendments after the Bill of Rights. Remember, yes, the Bill of Rights begins, Congress shall make no law of a certain set sort, and ends with the Tenth Amendment. But the Thirteenth, Fourteenth, and Fifteenth Amendments all end with the words, Congress shall have power, each one of them, reflecting the nationalism of the Civil War as opposed to the localism of the Revolutionary War. So these amendments after the Civil War codify that nationalism. Congress shall have power, the Thirteenth Amendment, Section 2. Congress shall have power, 14th Amendment, Section 5. Congress shall have power, 15th Amendment, Section 2. Um, so those amendments reflect uh, enhanced federal power, and so do amendments 16, 17, and 19. Um, another thing that happens that's happened in American history is wars, the Civil War, World War I. Wars tend to enhance the powers of the federal government vis-a-vis -vis the states, and, and, and that's going to be a trend. Remember, in the middle of the Civil War, Lincoln is trying to unify America, not just reunify, not just north and south, but east and west through a t transcontinental railroad. At the founding, the, the framers said that things that are genuinely interstate, um, transactions that involve more than one state that really spill over across state lines, those things the federal government can regulate, interstate commerce. But the reality at the founding is most stuff isn't interstate. Most people live and die in a 50-mile radius. You, you don't have a transcontinental railroad or, or, or jet 
uh, travel. So, so much of the economy genuinely is local at the founding. Um, before refrigeration, you have cows everywhere because you, um, uh, you, you need fresh milk. With the advent of refrigeration, you need cows just in a few places, California, Vermont, Wisconsin, a few more, and, and we can all drink from those cows uh, uh, because we've got transportation and refrigeration and communication technology, and, and Lincoln is a huge part of that, like with the Transcontinental Railroad. So one of the reasons we have more federal power today is that our world is genuinely more interstate and international, more connected than it was at the founding. But, and that's just a fact about the world that's changed. The framers said, if it's interstate, if it's international, the federal government can do it. And just a lot more stuff today is interstate and international in a world of the internet and, and supersonic uh, um, uh, uh, travel and, um, and um, the, the GATT and, and, and international trade. So a lot more of the world is genuinely international. That's a fact about the world. But also the Constitution has been amended to expand federal power, not just 13, 14, and 15 on matters of race and civil rights, that the federal government will take the lead in championing voting rights, the 15th Amendment, civil rights, uh, the 14th Amendment, and, and racial rights generally, uh, all three amendments. It's not just in human rights, not just that, that the federal government will have a special competence here that it didn't have before, um, but 16, 17, and 19 add additional um, federal powers and, and competences. Um, at the founding, what's the f federal government basically supposed to do? Interstate affairs, Western land, um, and, and foreign affairs. Um, and raise money for, um, uh, um, so if it's, if, if it's a revenue measure, the federal government can pretty much do it. If it if regulates an interstate problem, the federal government, that spills over across state lines, the federal government can pretty much do it. If it's a national security matter, the federal government can pretty much um, do it um, um, if it's a foreign affairs matter. That's sort of the founding vision. Reconstruction adds if it's a civil rights matter, a human rights matter, a voting rights matter, the federal government can do it. Now, the 16th, 17th, and 19th Amendments are going to continue to broaden the scope of federal power. The 16th Amendment is going to affirm, uh, and does, and it's adopted at the beginning of the 20th century, the power of the federal government to impose an income tax on individuals. Um, the 17th Amendment is going to make senators directly elected by the people of each state rather than the legislature of each state. And the 19th Amendment provides for women voting equally with men. Now, my claim is you put 16 plus 17 plus 19 together, and you get the New Deal, the Great Society, Obamacare. Here's how. And when you add all that to the founding, here's how. The 16th Amendment is going to be about a power of the federal government to use its taxing power to accomplish national redistributive projects. Uh, we'll talk more about this in the next lecture, but the 16th Amendment was very much designed by people who called themselves progressives, who believed in a progressive income tax that would redistribute, um, um, uh, that would take more, uh, redistribute e economic um, resources, take more from the wealthy. And you can more easily do that at the national level than at the state level, because if a state tries to do that, the rich people move out and the poor people move in. Um, but if the federal government tries to do that, it has a lot more ability to, to, to pursue national redistributive projects. What does the 17th Amendment do? The 17th Amendment frees state, uh, frees U.S. senators from dependence on state legislators. They're going to be f more free to pursue all sorts of national projects, uh, precisely because they're freed from uh, dependence on, on state legislatures. Even um, if they had the power to do something under the founding regime, they might have hesitated to do it because state legislatures wouldn't like that. Well, now it doesn't matter what state legislators like. It matters what the voters um, want. So um, um, uh, a modern world in which lots of senators become presidents, well, that's in part because senators are now directly elected populist politicians. That's the 17th Amendment. Um, world. The 19th Amendment, women are going to vote. Um, eventually, we come to see that women tend, on average, or at least have if for, for much of the last century, um, to vote um, uh, more for um, social welfare measures, um, um, uh, for, if you're a critic of it, the nanny state, if you will. We call that 
in part the, the gender gap. And today more women than men are voting. And so you add the 16th Amendment national redistributive um, uh, power in the federal government and the 17th Amendment, a Senate much more willing to vote for big federal projects and a 19th Amendment, women voting and women voting for um, social security and daycare and education, maybe because women um, historically have, have taken care of others um, uh, dis, uh, uh, in their uh, uh, elderly parents or, or dependent children, maybe because women um, uh, uh, then are particularly attentive to, to those vulnerable uh, members of society, maybe for other reasons. I, I frankly don't know why, but the data does suggest that women have um, in recent uh, eras voted more for some of this uh, social welfare legislation than have men. And that's a constitutional development. It's an amendment development. 16 plus 17 plus 19 is very quickly going to give you Franklin and Eleanor, the 19th Amendment, and you know, with a New Deal, and uh, uh, Bill and Hillary, Barack and Michelle. It's going to give you, in short, 16 plus 17 plus 19, the, uh, the New Deal, the Great Society, and Obamacare. Um, and these, I claim, are fully constitutional, not just because of the founding vision, uh, but because the founding vision has been supplemented by the Reconstruction vision, by the Progressive Era vision. In my next lecture, we're going to walk through these amendments in a little more detail with particular attention to the 16th Amendment, the Income Tax Amendment, the 17th Amendment, the Direct Election of Senators, and the 19th Amendment, maybe the most dramatic of all, the Women's Suffrage Amendment. So stay tuned. Welcome back. We're in the middle of our discussion of the Progressive Era Amendments, and we're going to focus in particular on the 16th, 17th, and 19th Amendments. The 16th Amendment, the Income Tax Amendment, reaffirms the power of the federal government to impose a tax on income. Um, and I say reaffirms because, in my view, the federal government always had this power. Remember, the Constitution is basically a pro-tax revolution enacted shortly after the anti-tax revolution of 1776. The Constitution is all about taxation with representation. The, the Declaration of Independence and the American colonies opposed um, uh, it said, said the Declaration of Independence in effect said, and the colonists uh, at the Revolution said, no taxation without representation. And the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, is all about taxation with representation. And we need taxation for various purposes, uh, most dramatically national defense. Uh, and the, um, the longest section of the, con the longest article is Article 1, and the longest section is Section 8. And Section 8 begins by saying Congress shall have power to basically tax you up and down and sideways, impose taxes, duties, imposts, and excises. How many ways can they basically say that you're going to be taxed, but don't worry, or uh, at least it, it, there's a reason why, maybe you should worry, but there's a reason why we need taxation for national security, and it will be legitimate because Congress will be representative. And in my view, there was nothing about a federal income tax that was distinctively problematic. Um, and uh, Abraham Lincoln thought the same thing. And during the Civil War, um, he signs his name to a law that imposes an income tax, and it's a progressive income tax. It taxes people who make um, who have more income at a higher rate, and it, and, and it exempts people who, who uh, um, make below a certain amount. Those are the two basic features of a progressive income tax. A progressive income tax basically takes proportionately more from the people who are making more money by exempting people below a certain amount and by having higher tax rates um, proportionately for um, uh, uh, people who are uh, higher uh, income earners. So Lincoln signs uh, an income tax a statute uh, in the middle of the Civil War, and it's upheld by courts. Many states had income taxes, all of which generally were, were progressive. Um, but 
um, the Supreme Court at the end of the 19th century did an about face and said, ah, income taxes are unconstitutional. And that's in part because the party of Lincoln, which begins as an anti-slavery party, eventually, because of, uh, it becomes the dominant party, the, the Democrats have discredited themselves because of uh, slavery and secession. Um, Lincoln's dominant political party attracts a lot of, of money and other things, so it morphs from a kind of an anti-slavery party to a, a, a corporate party. The party of Lincoln becomes the party of Grant, becomes the party of McKinley. Um, and in that era, the Supreme Court, uh, by a five to four vote over an emphatic dissent by John Marshall Harlan, the first John Marshall Harlan, the same guy who dissents in the, in the Plessy versus Ferguson case, but over his emphatic dissent, he says, this ruling is going to be a disaster for the country, but over his dissent, five justices proclaim an income tax unconstitutional because it's, quote, in their view, a direct tax which requires state apportionment. I'm not going to go into all the details except to say that, that I don't buy it. Uh, a lot of constitutional scholars who have studied the matter don't buy it. A lot of tax experts who have studied the matter carefully don't buy it. The direct tax language of the Constitution was very much bound up with all sorts of compromises about slavery. It was, uh, they were ways of camouflaging some of the pro-slavery aspects of the Constitution um, by linking the, uh, the idea of apportionment, representation, with taxation, but direct taxation. As I said, I'm not going to go into all the details except to say that I don't think an income tax is an improper direct tax within the mean of the Constitution. A direct tax is something that you simply can't avoid at all. A head tax, putting a tax of $10 on every person. Well, you just can't avoid that, short of death. That's a direct tax. It's also called a capitation. And one of the reasons the framers tried to limit direct taxes is they didn't want early Congresses to be able to, in effect, prevent the importation of of, uh, of slaves from abroad by, by taxing um, slave importation or taxing slaves themselves. So the, the, there were various pro-slavery compromises built into some of the language about direct tax, but even at the founding, I think it meant something very narrow. You can avoid an income tax, just don't make income. Um, uh, live off of um, uh, uh, your, your savings, um, do other things. So, so uh, uh, an, an income tax is not a direct tax. Um, maybe land taxes of a certain sort were also seen as direct taxes. Direct taxes on, on, on pieces of real property. Um, but, but an income tax, I think, at the founding was understood as a permissibly transactional indirect tax that was perfectly okay. Um, and so thought Abraham Lincoln and his generation. And the court originally upheld it, but then they invalidated it. And the American people basically rose up against the Supreme Court. Only four times in American history have the American people responded to a Supreme Court decision by overturning it by amendment. The 11th Amendment, when the judiciary early on went too far in expanding its own powers, that um, in a case called Chisholm versus Georgia, and that generated the 11th Amendment. Dred Scott went too far in a whole bunch of ways, and the 14th Amendment repudiated the Dred Scott case. Uh, the Pollock case, this income tax case, is repudiated by um, the income tax amendment, the 16th Amendment, and then there's going to be one more later in our story, so stay tuned on that one. Um, now, uh, members of both parties supported the income tax amendment. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt and, and, and William Howard Taft for the Republicans. Um, uh, uh, Woodrow Wilt at the Democratic Party had, was also on board. So um, amendments succeed um, when both parties are in favor of them, and that's what happens with the 16th Amendment. Um, which, as I said in my earlier lecture, my previous lecture, sort of laid the foundation in some very important ways for the, the modern redistributed estate. Our, the income taxes have, um, that we've had have always, at least in theory, been um, progressive redistributive income taxes. In practice, one can, one can raise questions. The 17th Amendment, also adopted in the, um, uh, uh, the 19-teens, as was the uh, uh, income tax amendment, the early 19-teens, the income tax amendment, provides for the direct election of senators. And you might wonder, why would existing senators ever go for that? Because remember, no amendment can pass unless two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of the Senate and three-quarters of the states say yes. So why would existing senators, who are basically picked by state legislatures, ever vote to change the rules by which senators are picked? 
And part of the answer is, by the time the 17th Amendment comes along, a bunch of senators are already kind of directly elected. There have been improvisations in the founder system. These improvisations begin as early as the 1850s with the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates in the wake of the Dred Scott case. In 1858, Abe Lincoln wants to be U.S. Senator from Illinois, and Stephen Douglas, who's the current U.S. Senator, wants to be reelected. And uh, legally, strictly speaking, they're go the Senator's going to be picked by the Illinois State Legislature. But what Lincoln and Douglas do, what the political parties do, the first, the political parties basically say, before the state legislative election, the Democrats say, we're going to nominate Stephen Douglas, and the Republicans say, we're for Abe Lincoln for Senate, and they announce that before the state legislative election. Now the state legislative election kind of becomes a referendum of sorts on whether you're a Lincoln man or a Douglas man. If you're a Lincoln man, vote Republican for state legislature. If you're a Douglas man, vote Democrat for state legislature. Now it's not perfect. It's not a perfect referendum because there's some malapportionment and gerrymandering and not all districts are um, open in the election and there might be other issues that you care about other than Lincoln versus Douglas. So it's not perfect, but but the election in 1858 for a state legislature was kind of rough referendum on whether you preferred Lincoln or Douglas. And in fact, Lincoln got slight, Lincoln's supporters cast slightly more votes than Douglas's supporters, but not quite enough to swing the election in his favor. Later generations of Americans will sort of further improvise toward a direct election system. In states that have basically, like where one party is dominant, um, the key becomes uh, to election becomes winning the party nomination and if the state uses a primary system to pick its um, a nominee, well, then the primary becomes, in effect, the direct election. Um, and a bunch of states, basically, especially in the South, were one-party states. The Democratic Party um, was uh, the, the dominant party in, in, some, Western, in some southern states. Um, uh, and um, uh, there were other one-party states in the, in the Midwest. Um, so primaries were a kind of direct election. Oregon improvised a different system. Oregon basically said, when you vote for Congress, for a U.S. Senator, for a member of the House of Representatives, for state legislature, uh, when you vote, we're going to put on the ballot a non-binding question. The non-binding question is, whom do you prefer for the U.S. Senate? Okay, and there were different iterations of it. The first version, like, whom do you prefer? And then, you know, we're going to have, actually have a second question. State legislators have to either promise to support the winner of the beauty contest. The beauty contest is who do you want for you as senator. So you either, you know, um, if you're running for state legislature, your name appears on the ballot, and whether you're a Republican or Democrat, and whether you've taken the pledge. I pledge to support the beauty contest winner. So if you pledge to support the beauty contest winner, even if you're a Democrat, if the Republican wins the beauty contest, you're promising to vote for the Republican for U.S. Senate. So um, second version is you know, your name and, and whether you've taken the pledge, or, and your party and whether you've taken the pledge. And an earlier and later version is you're actually required to honor your pledge. Now, what exactly that means, is that constitutional? But in any event, by the time the 17th Amendment comes along, a bunch of, of senators are already kind of directly elected through some version of the Oregon plan or through the primary system in one-party states. Um, and the 17th Amendment's adoption is a great dem democratizing um, uh, um, moment that will actually have reverberations uh, later on. Um, it's going to, for example, help um, make it easier for the U.S. Supreme Court much later to insist on one person, one vote for state legislative elections. Why? Because when state legislatures picked U.S. senators, um, remember state legislatures might be kind of malapportioned, and that malapportionment would uh, be the basis for the, the U.S. Senator's election and re-election. So U.S. Senators would have a stake in state legislative malapportionment b before the 17th Amendment. And it, they might make it hard for justices to invalidate state legislative malapportionment because, remember, justices has to have to be confirmed by the Senate. But with the 17th Amendment, now U.S. Senators are going to be elected one person, one vote statewide. They don't have a particular stake in state legislative malapportionment anymore. 
Um, think about how the 17th Amendment has kind of transformed the presidency. Before the 17th Amendment, members of the House were directly elected. Yes, they were more numerous, they were less prestigious. Um, senators were smaller, more elite, more prestigious, but they weren't directly elected. So maybe a person from the House could say, you know, I'm more of a populist politician than a person from the Senate. Well, after the 17th Amendment, senators become every bit as populist as House members, but elected statewide for six-year terms, a much more select body. So no member of the, before the 17th Amendment, various people went from the House of Representatives to the presidency without having their ticket punched in the Senate. After the 17th Amendment, we haven't had any of those types, um, who include people like James Madison, for example, James K. Polk. Um, but not since the 17th Amendment has a mere House member, a non-senator, won the presidency, uh, like Newt Gingrich or Dick Gephardt, something like that. Um, 17th Amendment has even changed um, how we think about um, the cabinet. Uh, uh, at the founding, um, uh, your state legislature sends you to the Senate, but they might prefer that you be in the cabinet. You can deliver all sorts of goodies to the state, so here's what they tell you. Go, to the sen go into the cabinet, we'll hold your seat, and when you're done with your cabinet service, you can go back, to, uh, we'll, we'll give you your Senate seat back. Uh, cabinet sandwiches, Senate to cabinet, back to Senate. There were a bunch of those before the 17th Amendment. That's not an easy deal. You can strike with the electorate at large. It doesn't quite work. So before the 17th Amendment, lots of cabinet sandwiches. After the 17th Amendment, no cabinet sandwiches. People leave the Senate to go into the cabinet, but they don't go back to the Senate. Lloyd Benson, um, Hillary Clinton, John Kerry, and others. They might leave the Senate to go to the cabinet, but they don't count on going back to the the Senate anymore. So the 17th Amendment has actually kind of changed all sorts of other um, aspects of government. Senators used to be much more commonly picked as Supreme Court justices since this, uh, in recent decades, not so much. Maybe that's because now U.S. Senators have to be much more populist politicians than before when they were sort of more elite statesmen. Maybe their earlier job description was a little closer to what a Supreme Court justice does, and their new job description is rather different. You have to be a populist politician, and maybe that's in slight tension with the kind of persona and personality that makes for the best Supreme Court justice. So the direct election of senators has had some um, all sorts of interesting in direct effects, if you will, over the cabinet, over presidential um, uh, 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 elections, um, uh, um, and uh, um, over the scope of national power, as I argued um, earlier, that, 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 that uh, senators are going to be much more willing to um, vote for, for um, uh, nationalist projects. Um, you're going to need a lot of money, maybe, to run for the Senate, and so People who thought the senators, Senate wasn't going to be a millionaire's club anymore if we have direct election, not so sure that they turned out to be right. But maybe the money is getting spread around in, in democratic campaigns rather than in bribes into the pockets of, of, of state lawmakers, for example, old-style state legislators. So, so the 17th Amendment has actually reconfigured our system, I think, in all sorts of, of, of interesting ways. But by far... The most important amendment, it seems to me, of the progressive era is the 19th Amendment. Direct, um, excuse me, um, uh, uh, the woman's suffrage amendment. Um, it's, in effect, a doubling of the franchise. So now, um, uh, by the numbers, maybe the most democratic event in all of American history. Um, and now let's take a step back and try to figure out how that happened. Because here's the real interesting thing. Before women get the vote, only men are voting, and only men are going to therefore be voting on whether women vote. So how do women ever sort of bootstrap themselves into the vote? Because they can't vote themselves the vote. They have to rely on men to, to vote first. So how does that ever happen? Um, and the answer is gradually, uh, it takes 50 years for women basically to get the vote from the Civil War era when black men get the vote with the 15th Amendment and women are shut out and they're, they're very disappointed. Um, it takes 50 years from that for them to finally prevail, the 19th Amendment, um, 1920. Um, and as with many constitutional reforms, this one begins first in the states. Federalism is an important part of our story here. Um, uh, national security is also going to come into the story. So it's going to be a story of democracy and its relationship 
to federalism and national security. Here's the federalism story. Remember the the great American project of populating the West, this epic story of taking these, um, uh, this uh, nearly virgin soil um, and and creating um, uh, civilized structures um, uh, which will eventually, um, and populating them and eventually admitting these regimes on equal footing with the older states. It's an amazing project. And, And part of that, in places like Wyoming, getting people to come to Wyoming, and in particular, getting women to come to Wyoming. Because in 1870, Wyoming basically, which is a territory, has, um, I think, five white men for every white woman. And they're desperate. They want women to come. And they're so desperate that they actually start saying, well, maybe we should actually listen to what women say. Women say they want to vote. So we're going to let them vote. If they come to Wyoming, we'll let them vote. And, hey, they say they want equal pay for equal work. We'll promise equal pay, too. So Wyoming first promises this, uh, the Wyoming uh, Territory. And and, um, Wyoming and Utah and Idaho and um, Colorado are the first states to promise women the vote. And the interesting thing is these are the states where there aren't very many women. Um, and in a way, when you step back, it makes sense because if men and women in a jurisdiction are 50-50 and you give women the vote and it turns out to be a mistake, because remember, the rest of the world isn't doing this yet, so you're, you experiment. You give women the vote and if it's 50-50, then you can't undo it. But if you outnumber them five to one, you give them the vote, it's a mistake, maybe you can take it back. Places where the men outnumber the women are also places where the men are most desperate to get women to come emigrate, and, and so supply and demand meets in a good place for women's suffrage in those jurisdictions. So it's a federalism story to some degree. Men, the, the place, the irony is the place where women get the vote first are the place where they're the fewest women. And that's not just true, Wyoming. And that's not just true in, in America, but in the world. The state where the country that first gives women the vote is New Zealand, which is kind of the Wyoming of the, the British Empire, where men outnumber women. In Australia, which also has kind of territories, a federal system, the places where um, uh, uh, women are fewest, Western Australia, the kind of Wyoming of Australia, gives women the vote earlier. So this is a story that, that it's true more internationally. But then here's the second part of it. So, so some states experiment. Federalism, laboratories of experimentation. And states are innovating here just as states first had bills of rights and written constitutions and um, uh, three branches of government and bicameral legislatures and states are getting rid of slavery first. And, and so states are leading the way on all sorts of things. States are putting constitutions to special votes first. So here's a few states are giving women the vote and the sky does not fall. So the other states start to follow suit eventually. I'm saying, well, if you're going to come all the way um, uh, across the plains and over the mountains, you know, why stop in Wyoming? Come all the way to California. You know, come to Oregon. Um, come to Washington. So other states start following suit at the beginning of the 20th century. By 1909, only only four states with only two percent of, of America's um, uh, uh, women: um, Colorado, Utah. Uh, Idaho and Wyoming. 1909, only four states. But by 1915, 16, a whole bunch of states have begun to join the bandwagon. Um, And now, if you want to run for president, you are a U.S. senator, you have to be in favor of women's suffrage. Because if you're not in favor of women's suffrage, you're conceding all those women's suffrage states. So one senator from Ohio, he's opposed to women's suffrage. His name is Atlee Pomerine, and you've never heard of him. The other Ohio senator who's in favor of women's suffrage, his name is Warren G. Harding, and he's going to get himself elected president on those women's votes. So, so, so once you see it start happening in a bunch of other states, you say, if you're a national politician who wants to be president, and that means lots of folks in the Senate, hey, I want to be in favor of that. And once you see different states um, um, voting um, taking votes on women's suffrage, and women's suffrage losing, let's say, 70-30 in the first vote. And then, but the women keep pushing, and then the next time women's suffrage loses, because remember, only the men are voting for it, on, on it. Um, so it loses 70-30. Then the next time, three years later, they get on the ballot again in the state, and it loses 60-40. And then they get on the ballot yet again, you know, three years later, because they're persistent, these women's suffragettes. And then it only loses 55-45, and now you think, eventually they're going to win. 
And if they win, do I want to be the last politician standing in the schoolhouse door resisting women's suffrage? Because as soon as they win, they're going to vote me out of office. So I have to k pay attention not just to the men who voted for me, but the women whom I might need for my reelection. And so you go from only 2% of America's women voting in 1909 to 100% in 1920. Once male politicians think that women are going to get the vote, it becomes almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. Then everyone kind of clambers on the bandwagon, wants to jump aboard it so that they're not on the wrong side of politics and history. So that's a federalism story. It's a story about incentive, political incentives. Um, it's also, though, the story of women's suffrage, is, and it's a story of women being very emphatic and, and working tirelessly again and again and again to get this. Women like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony and, and uh, their successors. Um, but it's also a story of national security, because what else is happening in this period? America is at war, World War I, and Woodrow Wilson initially opposes women's suffrage. He's a Southerner. Actually, he pretends he's a New Jersey person, but he's born in Staunton, Virginia. He grew up in, in Georgia. People in Georgia don't like the 15th Amendment, which guaranteed equal right, uh, voting rights for uh, blacks, so they don't want a 19th Amendment that's going to basically be the same thing except for sex, more federal intrusion into state voting regimes. Southerners don't like that. De Wilson is a Democrat. He's a Southerner. That's the base of the Democrat Party. He's inheriting still Thomas Jefferson's party, so initially he's not in favor of it. But then the women start shaming him. They chaining themselves to the White House gate and demanding um, right for women, saying, you're in a war and you say it's a war for democracy and, and yet you don't let your own women vote. And we're part of the war efforts. Yes, we're not on the battlefield, but we are providing the economic support um, that's um, helping the war effort. Um, and, uh, and so Wilson switches. And here's one of the other reasons that he switches. He believes that this war stands for, is about something, and, and eventually he wants it to be a war to end all wars. He wants to have a League of Nations that will emerge after the war, a League of Nations in which the United States is going to have to be involved so these European countries don't kill each other again, you know, and, and suck America in. So the United States is going to have to play a central role in the League of Nations as sort of the arbiter of old world disputes. Um, and he, as president, Woodrow Wilson, will be the leader of the free world. That's a new now um, job description of the president, not just commander-in-chief and veto-in-chief and appointer-in-chief, but leader of the free world. And he's imagining that for himself, and he's imagining that vision for the United States. But the United States will not be able to lead a League of Nations, which is going to be based on ideas and morals and not just who has the most military might. The United States will not have that moral leadership. And Wilson very much thinks of himself um, in terms of being a moral leader, won't have that credibility if we don't let, here in America, our women vote, especially because around the world, other societies are beginning to let their women vote. So Woodrow Wilson comes personally to the Senate of the United States dramatically. Uh, since Jefferson, um, uh, presidents basically had only sent messages to Congress. They didn't appear personally um, before Congress. But Wilson shatters that precedent um, and, and it goes and appears personally before the Congress in, uh, for various things. And one of them is an appeal to Congress to get them to, to support a woman's suffrage amendment as a war measure. Um, and he's explicit that this is as well. And now both parties eventually join on board, the Republicans and the Democrats, because if woman suffrage is going to happen, you don't want the other party to get the credit without your party getting the credit too. And Republicans say, well, we're the party of Lincoln and we gave you the 15th Amendment, so now we're going to do it again with the 19th. And the Democrats say, we're the party of Woodrow Wilson and he's in favor of it, so we are too. And you get the 19th Amendment and the world will not be the same. Women's suffrage, I think, transforms the nature of, women, women's po of, of American politics today. More women vote than men. If women all voted for the same candidate, they could basically decide every election in the country. And if the men are close to evenly divided, the women decide. That's because of the transformative 19th Amendment. Um, uh, and I'm going to come back to that in... Um, uh, well, let me just tell you that that's what this... this um, uh, Depiction is all about women crusading for women's votes, marching in New York City. I think this is in 1912 or so. I believe they're marching down Broadway. Um, I'm going to come back to this at the very end. 
There are other amendments of the Progressive Era. The 18th Amendment gives you prohibition, and the 21st Amendment takes it away, um, and sort of undoes it. There's an amendment about um, uh, having the presidential term begin in January rather than um, January 20th after the November election rather than in March. Um, I'm going to say a little bit more about that amendment um, in my next pair of lectures because that amendment is designed to reduce the lame duck period. Someone gets elected in November, but they have to wait all the way till January before taking office. It turns out, and before the 20th Amendment, they have to wait all the way till March. It turns out there's a way of having the person who won the election, let's say Romney had won the election against Obama, having that person take office not in January, but the day after the election. It turns out there's a way to do that. And that has to do with a later amendment, a later 20th century amendment, uh, 20th century amendment that we're going to talk about in the next pair of lectures, the 25th Amendment. Um, so we're going to talk about that in the next uh, set of lectures. And we're also going to talk about another generation of Americans that takes to the streets. The women are taking to the streets to right a great historical wrong and injustice, that they've been excluded from the franchise, and that's not right. And they take to the streets in the 19-teens, and they prevail 50 years later. Another half century later, a new generation will arise, another generational spurt, uh, spurt of amendments. And this generation will once again take to the streets to right some great historic injustices and wrongs. And that's the story that we're going to tell, among others, in the next pair of lectures. So stay tuned. Welcome back. We've now reached our final chapter, quite literally, in the story of the written Constitution. I say quite literally because, as you'll recall, we're walking through uh, the written Constitution in textual order, um, and in the process, we're also tracking uh, a book that I did in, in 2005 called America's Constitution, a biography. Uh, and that book tracks uh, the flow of the text which is in turn chronologically laid out. We started with the founding era, the original Constitution, followed very quickly by the first ten amendments, the so-called Bill of Rights, uh, a judiciary-limiting Eleventh Amendment, uh, and a pro-populist, pro-partisan presidency, pro-democracy, but alas also pro-slavery, Twelfth Amendment, um, codifying kind of the Jeffersonian vision of the presidency, and that brought the founding era to a close, uh, the original Constitution and the first 12 amendments. Then we flashed, uh, we uh, moved forward in time, uh, and after the Civil War, we encountered the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, ending slavery and guaranteeing civil and eventually political equality to African Americans. Uh, more recently, we, we flashed forward yet again um, and focused on the amendments of the uh, progressive era, the beginning of the 20th century. We focused particular attention on the 16th, 17th, and 19th amendments uh, from that era, income tax, direct election of senators, and, and woman suffrage. Uh, today and in the next lecture, we're going to talk about the more modern amendments, the late 20th century uh, amendments. And as I said, that's the last chapter of, of the book, um, America's Constitution, a biography. Uh, but before we talk about um, the late 20th century uh, amendments, um, you might have thought that I gave short shrift to the 18th and the 21st amendments uh, from the the early 20th century, the 18th uh, uh, enacting prohibition and the 21st repealing it. And if you thought that, you were right. I did kind of breeze by those because the 21st basically, in effect, undoes the 18th. I can't cover everything in exquisite detail in these lectures. If you do want more background on, on those amendments or on virtually anything else that we discuss in, in this uh, uh, online course, um, the book, 
has lots more detail on that. But I thought I should say just a word or two about the 18th and the 21st before moving forward. The 18th Amendment was um, part of the progressive era, um, and, and those who uh, supported prohibition saw it as uh, consistent with, uh, many of those who supported it saw it as very consistent with the other uh, reforms um, of the era, uh, er, the, an era that gave us initiative and referendum and recall, uh, the p political primaries, a kind of a democratic reform, um, uh, direct election of senators. This was an era that, resist, uh, that was uh, uh, in which a lot of social energy was spent sort of resisting forces of corruption, corporate corruption, uh, city bosses. Uh, state legislatures were seen as somewhat corrupt in the way they picked senators, often um, taking bribes and the like. So direct election of senators was a kind of clean government reform. It turns out that in order to run clean elections, that requires a lot of money too, campaign contributions, but maybe that money is spread around in ad campaigns directed at the, the populace rather than slipped into the pockets of, uh, of state legislators. But direct election of senators was a kind of um, uh, reform. And, 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 and uh, uh, woman suffrage, of course. Um, uh, prohibition was also seen as a reform of sorts. The saloons and big cities were seen as particularly corrupt places. Um, There's a feminist angle to the whole thing. Many women felt that um, men, especially working men, were uh, getting their wages on Friday afternoon, going to the saloon, drinking down their wages rather than bringing the, uh, the money home uh, to their wives and, and kids. And instead, um, because they had been drinking too much at the saloon, they would come uh, home and, and beat up their wives and kids. That was a stereotype or an image uh, that, that, that fueled the prohibition movement, and it was a movement strongly supported by women. Remember, um, uh, maybe from the history books, uh, uh, a famous organization you might have heard of, the Women Christian Temperance Union. Um, and indeed, uh, one of the major forces um, that lobbied against women's suffrage was the liquor lobby because they feared that women's suffrage would actually lead to prohibition, lead to dry laws. And indeed, the 18th Amendment and the 19th Amendment are coming from the same era. Prohibition also had a, a national security angle. Um, uh, there was... Um, uh, a uh, need for um, grain during World War I, and, and, and people said, well, grain is being diverted to, to make beer and, and other things. So um, uh, uh, um, I did want to just briefly mention prohibition since I gave it short shrift uh, last time. Uh, it's the one amendment, really, of uh, all of them that arguably restricts liberty and equality. And interestingly, it's the one that doesn't take. Shortly after uh, prohibition is passed uh, in the 19-teens, um, it's repealed in the early 1930s. So, uh, um, and that's the 21st Amendment. And that's one of the reasons I didn't spend so much time on it, because the 21st, in effect, cancels out um, the 18th. But one interesting question is, how is it, from a process point of view, that an amendment could be passed, remember it requires two-thirds of the House, two-thirds of the Senate, three-quarters of the states, and yet so quickly thereafter you get two-thirds, two-thirds, three-quarters for the exact opposite position. How could that swing happen so soon? Um, and, um, and one factor, I think, is that, that this was an era, the early 20th century, of, of ex democratic experimentation. The progressives believed in, in progress. They believed in trying things, but also learning uh, from the data. And many people considered prohibition a failed experiment. It was designed to stamp out uh, the corruption of the saloon. It didn't do that at all. It just drove liquor underground, it, speakeasies, and, um, uh, and a lot of organized crime. Um, uh, uh, by the time of the, um, the Great Depression, a lot of people just <laughs> wanted and perhaps needed a drink uh, 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 from time to time. Um, and uh, if you uh, repealed prohibition you, and brought this industry back uh, into the daylight, you could tax it. And that would be a source of, of government revenue, a, a sorely needed revenue. Um, so some people who supported prohibition in the 19-teens, some politicians actually changed their minds. So you can look at the votes and, and you can see some people who voted both for prohibition and its repeal. Uh, but another factor uh, is that prohibition emerged from a somewhat malapportioned 
system. Cities tended to be wet, pro-liquor. Counties um, tended to be dry, uh, anti-liquor, prohibitionist. Uh, And uh, in the early 20th century, lots of state legislatures were malapportioned. Many house districts were malapportioned. And uh, so in this malapportionment, the counties counted for, the rural counties counted for more than their fair share. The cities got um, short shrift. Um, They weren't really proportionally represented. The urban areas, which were wet, um, more immigrant, um, uh, more um, uh, um, uh, 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 pro-liquor. And and so um, the the process that generated the 18th Amendment was one that kind of overweighted um, rural areas in the ratification process um, and even in the House of Representatives. By the time of the 21st Amendment, however, Congress, for the first and only time, said, we want this amendment to be ratified not by state legislatures, but by specially elected conventions of the citizenry. And those specially elected conventions were, in effect, in many places, adopted one person, one vote statewide. So there wasn't the kind of malapportionment. So so cities played a bigger role in that process. So with both direct election of senators and the 21st Amendment, we see an anticipation of the one-person, one-vote idea. Remember, when senators are picked by state legislatures and state legislatures are malapportioned, then the Senate is basically a feature of that that malapportioned system. But with the 17th Amendment, direct election of senators, you count all the the voters in the state equally, one person, one vote, and and, uh, so uh, the Senate itself is is a one person, one vote idea, and so too um, the process that generated the 21st Amendment uh, involved one person, one vote. It's also possible that ordinary people are more willing to just sort of vote openly for liquor, whereas some politicians, uh, state legislators, so so in the convention, um, basically uh, they're not ordinary politicians there. It's it's kind of like a referendum of sorts, and people vote their preferences. They they want to drink. But politicians and state legislatures, even though they may occasionally have a drink or two themselves on the sly, they, they might have hesitated to vote for liquor, to be seen as soft on, on morality or something like that. So there's in, sometimes a possibility that ordinary voters might have a sort of different tendencies than the professional politicians. Okay, so that was the 18th and the 21st. Um, uh, but now um, let's carry the story forward in time, recall that virtually all the amendments that we've had um, have come in generational spurts or clusters. In the founding era, the first 12, um, beginning as, uh, shortly after the Constitution is ratified and ending in, uh, wi- in Thomas Jefferson's first administration, the 12th Amendment, 12 amendments, um, a 10 in the Bill of Rights, uh, an 11th limiting the judiciary, and uh, a 12th modifying the rules of the Electoral College. That's the founding generation's amendments. And then you have the Civil War Reconstruction Generation's amendments, 13, 14, 15. Then you have this spurt of amendments in the 19 teens uh, carrying forward to the repeal of of prohibition um, in the early 1930s. Um, And the final set of amendments were all uh, ratified um, uh, in in a a generational, um, a later generational spurt pretty much. Uh, uh, The next spurt is really going to be 1960s. But there's one um, standalone amendment um, uh, kind of that's worth mentioning. And then the uh, the final amendment is a little tricky, so I'll I'll tell you about that tomorrow uh, in the next lecture. But but the two-term amendment, the 22nd Amendment, kind of stands alone uh, chronologically. It's ratified in 1951, so it's you know, almost 20 years after um, the lame duck uh, amendment and the repeal of prohibition, which is early on in Franklin Roosevelt's um, ad- ad- administration. Uh, and uh, so, so 20 years basically after the last set of amendments and 10 years before the next cluster, this two-term amendment kind of just stands out there on its own um, chronologically, and let's, let's talk about that amendment. Uh, remember that the original Constitution on, uh, on paper allows for a president to be perpetually reelected. Every four years he has to come before the electorate, and four years means absolutely four years. Um, come hell or high water, we hold 
presidential elections in the middle of civil wars and world wars and great depressions. That's not true in an English parliamentary system where the elections can sometimes be pushed back. And in fact, in, in World War II, basically Parliament postponed elections. There basically um, uh, was no election at all, a regular parliamentary election be in England between 1935 and 1945. Um, uh, but in America, we held elections on schedule every four years for the presidency. Uh, Lincoln, in the middle of the Civil War, um, uh, uh, submits to the voters' judgment. And, um, but the, under the Founders' a writ, uh, written constitution, presidents are perpetually re-eligible. But as we talked about before, George Washington set all sorts of important precedents. And one of the most important is that he stepped down after two terms. He would have been re-elected had he stood for a third term. He was unanimously picked the first time around in 1789. He was unanimously re-elected in 1792. He would have been unanimously or virtually unanimously re-re-elected, but he stepped down. Um, and he didn't say a lot about it, um, but later Americans came to understand um, uh, that Washington was sending a signal that the republic needs to be bigger than any one person. Um, and that he was kind of in part sending that message that other people are perfectly capable of, of carrying uh, the, the, the torch. Um, uh, um, uh, and, and indeed, um, when Thomas Jefferson wins re-election, he steps down after, after his second term and says explicitly, I don't think we should have, in effect, a lifetime presidency. Um, John Adams, of course, runs for re-election and loses, so it's not really an issue for him. But when Thomas Jefferson wins his second term, um, uh, at the end of that, he declines to run again. Um, and remember, in the states, governors that were um, uh, 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 governorships that um, uh, had no term limits to them, the governors were almost always reelected, basically until they died or you know were close to death. John Hancock in Massachusetts, George uh, uh, Clinton uh, in New York, um, uh, 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 Trumbull in. In, in, in Connecticut, um, also in New Jersey. Governors who could run for re-election ran again and again and again and were almost always elected. Um, but Jefferson didn't like that model, so he said, like Washington, I think I should step down after two terms. Um, uh, Tom, uh, and after Jefferson, James Madison did the same thing. James Monroe did the same thing. Uh, John Quincy Adams runs for re-election and loses. Andrew Jackson, after two terms, steps down. Thus, a tradition emerges. It's not in the text, but it's tr a tradition of two terms. Now, that tradition isn't inviolable. Um, uh, the next uh, president who gets re-elected, Abraham Lincoln, is assassinated, so we, we never know whether he would have chosen to follow that example or not. Um, McKinley also is assassinated in his second term, so we don't know. We do know that there were some presidents who um, did dream, at least, of, of, of third terms. It, it's a little cheeky, though, given the tradition. If you're basically saying, well, I'm greater than General Jackson and General Washington and Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, because you know I'm going to seek a third term even though they didn't. But Ulysses Grant, after two terms, steps down following the Washington precedent, and Grant is in a lot of ways like George Washington, this general above political party. He steps down, but then four years later, he gets the itch and he kind of runs again. Um, and maybe you see the tradition is not so clear. Is it, no, is it that um, uh, no third term or no third consecutive term? There's an ambiguity in this unwritten tradition. So Grant steps down. And, uh, but runs in the Republican uh, uh, process, the Republican convention, four years later doesn't get it. Um, Grover Cleveland, he wins, then he loses his bid for re-election, then he runs again and wins, so he now has two terms, and, and he dreams of a third term. It wouldn't be a third consecutive term. It would be a third total term, but uh, only um, a second consecutive term. Um, but the Democratic Party isn't interested in having him. Um, there's another issue uh, unresolved in the tradition. How do you count partial terms? Teddy Roosevelt basically has three years as president when McKinley dies, then he wins in his own right. Can he run for a second term in his own right? Two full terms as president plus in you know, early threes. Well, he decides not to. 
Uh, um, uh, but then four years later, he, and, and Taft becomes president, but four years later, Ro Teddy Roosevelt gets the itch again, and he runs, and he says, yeah, when I said I, I didn't want a third term, I meant a third consecutive term. If I said I didn't want a third cup of coffee, coffee no one would think that I was forever giving up the beverage. Uh, so he runs, loses. Um, Woodrow Wilson is dreaming of a third term even after his stroke. So, so the tradition is... Um, ambiguous in certain respects, how to think about third terms, how to think about non-consecutive terms. Um, and of course, famously, Franklin Roosevelt serves not two, not three, but he actually uh, serves into his fourth term. He dies early in his fourth term, but he, he runs for a third term and gets reelected for that third term and runs for a fourth term and gets reelected. And in the wake of that, the two-term amendment, the 22nd Amendment, uh, emerges, um, and it's kind of a, a retrospective rebuke to some extent of, of the Roosevelt precedent. It's saying, you know, uh, never again should one person make himself so indispensable. And remember, this is emerging in a world where there's anxiety about other, uh, other strong uh, leaders around the world, Stalin and Hitler and Mussolini, and so people say, American democracy should never be organized around one indispensable man, the fearless leader, the big brother. So the critique is um, that uh, we shouldn't have basically precedencies for life. The folks on the other side say, well, it's up to the voters to decide. We have elections, and if you don't want the fellow, vote against him. And the believer in, in presidential term limits say, no, but a president as a practical matter can entrench himself in all sorts of ways and make himself an indispensable leader. And, and so in the name of democracy, we're going to limit presidential terms. Uh, and interestingly, once the federal government does that, a bunch of states follow suit for governorships. Many states, though, prohibit um, just um, more than two cons uh, consecutive terms, but they allow non-consecutive third and, and even fourth terms. Uh, but once again, we see a very interesting interplay between state, uh, state constitutions and the federal constitution. State, um, uh, um, uh, the constitution was modeled on, on state constitutions to some extent. It created and, and in turn was copied by state constitutions. The constitution, in particular the presidency, created a very strong executive branch and then states started to reconfigure at the founding their governorships to look more like presidents. Four-year terms, veto pens, pardon pens became much more common at the state gubernatorial level after Article II had um, put forth that model. And so too, after the constitution, the federal constitution is amended to add term limits for the presidency. A bunch of state constitutions add term limits um, for governorships. Now, these term limits create very interesting um, incentives. And I'm going to close, actually, with a, uh, this lecture with a conversation about sort of what, what happens when you term limit um, the executive. Um, well, one thing, maybe, you see in, in um, uh, uh, is, uh, is that, um, that you, you, we've seen is actually presidents in their second terms are weakened. They're lame ducks from day, in t uh, from day one. And so their enemies can come out and attack them knowing that they're not going to even be able to threaten to run a th on a third term and, and vanquish their foes. And so um, we've seen in second term presidencies uh, uh, recently um, uh, pr uh, Richard Nixon resigning in disgrace under the threat of impeachment. Bill Clinton actually being um, impeached, um, not convicted, uh, but impeached. Ronald Reagan having Iran being w wounded uh, politically and Iran Contra in his um, second term. Um, uh, George uh, W. Bush kind of limping along a bit in his uh, second term. We'll see how the Obama second term um, runs. But, but one feature uh, structurally is that the um, two term amendment makes a president a lame duck at the beginning of the second term. At the state level, um, sometimes uh, term-limited governors have, have, pick, have run their wives. Um, uh, in effect, you know, vote for Lurleen Wallace, uh, for George Wallace's you know, additional term, um, and uh, Ma Ferguson in Texas. And um, uh, so, so uh, that's been a strategy that sometimes has occurred at the state level. But the final thing I want to talk about at the federal level is how this weakening of the presidency through the two-term amendment has actually empowered 
vice presidents. If a president can't run for a third term on his own, but he can run, in effect, by proxy by picking his wingman, his vice president, to be his third term. And before the two-term amendment, you didn't see, vice presidents really weren't very significant. They were significant um, at the founding, because remember, at the founding, for the, at the very, very beginning, the vice president is the guy who comes in second for the presidency. So John Adams is someone substantial. So was Thomas Jefferson. They ran for the presidency, came, you know, but came in second. But the, remember, the 12th Amendment lets you vote separately for president and vice president. It creates a ticket system, and after the 12th Amendment, vice presidents basically are, are really not typically very important political figures. There are one or two who are significant, but generally not. But after the 22nd Amendment, vice pre uh, presidents kind of begin to come into their own. Be between the 12th Amendment and the 22nd Amendment, the two-term amendment, only about 15% of vice presidents ever ran, won the party, uh, their party nomination for the presidency itself. They weren't sort of major figures. But since the two-term amendment, more than half of them have um, uh, vice presidents have actually won the party uh, nomination uh, for presidency uh, later on. Um, at the end of the 20th century, I think five resigning presidents all sort of watched um, their wingman, their vice president, sort of run for president um, in his own right. So Eisenhower watched Nixon run, um, and um, uh, Nixon and, and Johnson watched um, Humphrey run for president, his, his vice president. Um, and Richard Nixon, who had, just, who had resigned already, watched Gerald Ford um, uh, run, and Reagan watched um, a George H.W. Bush run, and Clinton watched Gore uh, run and win, again, the party nomination. So one of the important stories uh, of the 22nd Amendment has been how it's actually strengthened the political tag team between president and vice president. Uh, vice presidents become president's wingmen, um, and, and the way, in effect, in the modern era, you win a third term, you become like Franklin Roosevelt, is not by running and winning in your own right, but having your hand-picked successor run. George... Uh, um, H.W. Bush, that was Reagan's third term um, on, on this interpretation. Uh, now, um, two of the themes that we've talked about today, uh, one person, one vote, and the tag team between president and vice president are going to be themes we're also going to see in, um, the 19, in the last round of amendments from the 1960s, and that's going to be the story I'm going to tell you in the next lecture. So, hope to see you. Welcome back. We're up to the set of amendments in the 1960s, uh, the most recent really set of amendments, uh, and uh, uh, the 23rd and 24th amendments um, fit very nicely into our general story. The 23rd amendment brings the District of Columbia into the electoral college system. Remember, the electoral college system is one in which di different states are assigned electoral votes based on their population, originally pegged, uh, connected to the three-fifths clause, but with the end of slavery, the three-fifths clause has dropped away. But the electoral college system is one in which states um, are basically the, the, the fundamental units for determining presidential elections. And the 23rd Amendment says, well, we're going to allow D.C. to be part of that electoral college system. It's not going to be a state for the House of Representatives, it's not going to be a state for the Senate, but we are going to allow it to, to have a few electoral votes, as if it were a, a state in, in effect. Um, and the 24th Amendment is going to end, uh, uh, prohibits um, poll taxes uh, in states uh, being used um, to prevent people from voting in federal elections, um, and, uh, uh, for, the, for example, for the Senate, for the House of Representatives, for the presidency. The Supreme Court is going to take, um, uh, in the same era, the 1960s, some of the deep animating principles underlying that 24th Amendment and actually say, gee, not only should there be no poll taxes for federal elections, um, there should be no poll tax uh, disfranchisement 
for state elections either. So how, you might ask, does that fit into the general story thus far? Remember, the general story thus far has been a story of democracy, national security, and slavery slash race. So let's take the District of Columbia. Here's one thing you need to understand about D.C. There is a very substantial proportion of non-whites who live in D.C., of African Americans. That's true today. It has been true for the last 150 years at least. Uh, remember, uh, early on, um, the district of, before Abraham Lincoln's presidency, the District of Columbia is actually a slaveholding jurisdiction. It's, um, it's part of uh, uh, it's on the border between um, Virginia and Maryland, both of which were slave states um, uh, uh, when the Civil War broke out. So there are a lot of black people who live in D.C., and when you bring D.C. into the electoral college system, you are advancing democracy uh, and actually the cause of, of racial justice. And democracy is itself part of the process. It's not just the result of D.C. is being brought in, but it's part of the process. Um, we've been talking about a, a party competition, presidential parties. Um, both parties support, the Republicans and the Democrats, support this move to bring D.C. into the electoral college fold. And that's because in the middle of the 20th century, both the Republican and the Democrat Party are um, vying for uh, the allegiance of African Americans, actually. Before FDR, blacks very reliably vote Republican, Party of Lincoln, before th 1932. After 1972, after sort of um, uh, um, the uh, um, uh, African Americans overwhelmingly vote Democrat. Um, but between 1932 and 1972, so sort of the black vote is kind of up for grabs. Both political parties are, are trying to get it. Blacks are a swing democratic, uh, a, a, a swing uh, demographic, excuse me, constituency, maybe like Hispanics are at the beginning of the, the, the 21st century. So um, FDR has won a bunch of black votes, and Truman um, is, uh, 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 has desegregated the armed forces, and, and, and when he runs for a election in his own right, it's the black vote that's the margin of victory. Um, uh, had um, uh, Dewey, Thomas Dewey, who ran against him, actually won the African-American vote, Dewey would indeed have beaten Truman and won the presidential election. Eisenhower was trying to win back the black vote, and, um, and uh, both um, uh, uh, Nixon and uh, Kennedy in um, 1960 are vying for, for the black vote. And D.C. is kind of part of, of uh, that whole conversation about African Americans uh, more generally. And uh, the 23rd Amendment is proposed uh, uh, under Ike and ratified under JFK, and um, I think it's a nice symbol of um, uh, some of these issues. Now, how does national security factor into this? So we've talked about democracy and we've talked about race. Um, national security figures in, in part because there's not just a domestic audience when it comes to race relations in America, but an international audience. We're in the middle of a Cold War, and the Soviet Union is having a propaganda field day um, in Africa and Asia. That's, that's the battlefield of the Cold War. We're trying to win um, a Cold War, for the, and we're trying to win for the hearts and minds of brown skin and black skin and yellow skin people in Africa and Asia and South America. And the Soviet Union is saying, oh, the United States doesn't practice what it preaches. It has segregation. It has discrimination. Look, its national capital has a bunch of black people, and they don't even get to vote fairly in, in presidential elections. And and the 23rd Amendment is, you know, trying to actually say to the rest of the world, no, actually, we um, are trying to solve our, our racial problems. Now, you might say, well, D.C. was never um, in the Electoral College system. It's not about race. It's just the Constitution has different rules for territories. And that made a certain amount of sense at the founding. Um, D.C. wasn't part of the Electoral College system, but neither were the territories. And there were a lot of territories, and a lot of people lived in the territories. But as the territories gradually became states, admitted on equal footing, remember the story that we told thus far, the states, the new state, the, the territories, the West wasn't being treated as a permanent Western colony of the East Coast. As those territories became states, 
it seemed increasingly anomalous that DC was left behind. So DC, you know, was left out of the system even as the territories became states. And at the time that that anomaly became increasingly clear, when the West, uh, the, the 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 frontier ended, and 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 Wyoming and Arizona and the other uh, Western states are finally uh, coming in. DC status seemed increasingly anomalous, and people started to notice a lot of black people are living there now. And um, uh, so, so DC being brought into the, um, the the fold is is part of a larger geostrategic story. Remember, at the same time that this is happening, Hawaii is becoming a state, the, the 50th state, Hawaii 50. Alaska is becoming the 49th state. Um, uh, projecting beyond the continental lower 48, the contiguous lower. 48, and there's a national security story there. Um, we want to project power um, after World War II into the Pacific. Pearl Harbor, you know, was a, a scene of military disaster, but we have to project power into the Pacific Rim uh, toward um, uh, Japan. Um, uh, uh, Alaska uh, borders on uh, Siberia, the Soviet Union. We want listening posts uh, close to the Soviet Union. Remember, also, Alaska has a pretty substantial proportion of non-whites, Aleuts, um, and Native um, Americans. Uh, uh, Hawaii has a very large percentage of, of non-whites. So um, Alaska and Hawaii and D.C. are all part of a story of the Cold War, of race, um, but also of increasing democracy. This is also the era, the 1960s, that's going to give us an Immigration Reform Act that's going to make it possible for people from Africa and Asia and South America increasingly to come to the United States. And this is part of the Cold War idea. We want to be open to the talent of all, of all the rest of the world. Um, and, and D.C. is part of that, that larger story. Um, now, D.C. is still not quite given full treatment. It's not in the House of Representatives. It um, it's uh, doesn't have two senators. It's not admitted as a state. Um, and I'm not predicting necessarily that that will happen uh, soon because that the window of special opportunity, I think, um, closed to some extent um, in the middle of the 20th century. Because remember what I said, blacks are politically in play. They're a swing constituency between 1932 and 1972, and they make a lot of progress in part because both political parties are vying for them. Much as earlier political parties didn't want to offend women, and so at a certain point both basically said, oh, we're for women's suffrage. Well now, um, when blacks are in play, um, both parties are, are wooing them. But after 1972, blacks are quite reliably members of the Democratic uh, coalition, and not at all clear that Republicans would support D.C. statehood, for example, because that's going to mean two more Democrat senators, um, another one, possibly two uh, members of the House of Representatives who would be Democrats. So not at all clear that Republicans would support um, more stuff for D.C. today, constitutional uh, or um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, tweaks or, or full statehood. Not at all clear that the today's Republican Party would support that, but the Republican Party of the middle 20th century, the party of, of Eisenhower, did very much support that. And remember, you know, it's an Eisenhower appointee, Earl Warren, who, who hands down Brown versus Board of Education. Um, and in fact, Eisenhower's Justice Department supports Brown versus Board of Education. And so, um, so in this period, in the middle of the 20th century, both Republicans and Democrats are actually supporting civil rights um, uh, and, 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 and voting rights. And that takes us very naturally to the next amendment, which is about voting rights. And it's an amendment that says states shouldn't um, have poll taxes that prevent uh, people, because they can't pay those taxes, from voting in federal elections. Remember, under the original Constitution, you get to vote for the House of Representatives if you can vote for your state legislature. So state law sort of defines in the first instance who's eligible to vote even for, for Congress. Remember, states regulate how the, the presidential electors are to be selected. Um, it's a state-defined electorate that, that picks senators um, under the 17th Amendment, the direct election amendment. And 24th Amendment said, well, for federal elections, the inability or the unwillingness to pay a poll tax should never be a basis for disenfranchisement. You should be allowed to vote whether you pay a tax or not. Um, this is a grand egalitarian Republican idea, or small r Republican, small d Democrat. And both the Republican and the Democrat Party support this amendment. 
Um, and the Supreme Court, a Supreme Court that's led by a Republican Chief Justice but has a majority of New Deal Democrat appointees on it, is going to go one step further and say, not only should there be no poll tax disenfranchisement for state, uh, for federal elections, we shouldn't have it for state elections either. A, republic, a Republican government, small r, should be a government of the people, race publica, the people's thing. Um, not, not the properties thing. Not the t not, it's not about money or, or taxes. It's, it's about um, the, pe the people deciding um, whom they want to re represent them. And so um, these amendments, um, uh, uh, the 23rd and the 24th, um, are, are powerful extensions of this democracy idea that we saw at the founding that carried forward through the Reconstruction that was further elaborated by, the, for example, the direct election of senators in the Progressive Era. So th that, that general story continues with these um, amendments. And at the very same time that these amendments are being proposed, Republicans and Democrats in the middle of uh, the 1960s are going to get together and pass an epic Voting Rights Act that further reinforces the idea of federal protection of voting rights, implementing the grand themes of the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment that had to some extent laid dormant. Because here's one thing, that dirty <coughs> the dirty little secret that I didn't mention about poll taxes. Poll taxes are basically used in the former Confederacy um, uh, at when in the 1960s. Those are the only states that really have poll tax disenfranchisement, and they probably disenfranchise blacks disproportionately. And, and, and this amendment and the Supreme, accompanying Supreme Court cases extending this amendment uh, understood all of that. So definitely a story of race. And the, and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 following on the heels of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, act supported by Republicans as well as Democrats, Party of Lincoln Republicans as well as uh, Democrats that are trying to repudiate new Democrats, uh, the legacy of the old Democratic Party, which is about slavery and segregation. Um, this, this coalition that gives you the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, is doing so again in part with attention to a world stage, trying to persuade people of goodwill in Africa and Asia and South America that America actually um, is an open society that really does practice what it preaches, which is after the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, equality, which is after the direct election of senators, an idea of of equal voting and one person, uh, one vote. And indeed, in this era, the Supreme Court is going to give us some landmark cases, which we're going to talk about much later in, in this lecture series, on the idea of one person, uh, one vote. 25th Amendment. It's also about um, war, in particular a Cold War. After um, President Kennedy's assassination, Americans realized with sort of blinding clarity that the rules of presidential succession need to be modified. Um, uh, God forbid had President Kennedy um, uh, been in a coma, uh, um, lingered for a long period of time, um, uh, 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 um, uh, maybe in a persistent vegetative stage, something like that, um, it was not entirely clear how the, a vice president could pronounce a president sort of uh, unable, disabled to uh, discharge the office and put himself forward. And, and in a Cold War with um, uh, 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 nuclear weaponry, uh, minutes can matter. I mean, there always has to be someone ready to take charge, and the, twin, and the original Constitution didn't have a very uh, elaborate system specifying who should declare a president disabled? It also said that if a president did die and the vice president um, uh, became president, came forward, the Constitution didn't provide a mechanism, uh, a backup for creating a new vice presidency. Um, so for 40 years of American history, uh, before the 25th Amendment, America basically didn't have a vice presidency because the vice president had died and there was no way of filling that vacancy, uh, or the vice president had resigned and there's no way of filling that vacancy, or a president had died and the, or, or resigned, um, uh, become disabled, uh, and the vice president had moved up 
into the presidency. Again, there's no way to fill the vacancy. The 25th Amendment plugs some of those gaps, and it's in part motivated by Cold War reality that minutes can count, even seconds can count, and there has to be uh, a person capable of making decisive decisions at every moment. And the 25th Amendment says, look, if the president dies, the vice president actually officially becomes president. It made that clear. There was maybe an ambiguity about that. That had been our tradition, but uh, the 25th Amendment makes that very clear. If a vice president becomes president because the president has died or um, uh, resigned, we can, that incoming president can fill the vice presidential vacancy, can nominate someone basically to, um, to be the new vice president subject to special congressional confirmation uh, process. And if a sitting president um, is uh, uh, going to undergo some planned surgery or something that, like that, no, he's going to be out of action for a while, no, he's going to be temporarily disabled, he can um, provide, the, the 25th Amendment provides a mechanism by which he can basically officially designate the vice president as the person in charge, and then when he recovers, um, take that back um, very easily, allowing seamless handoffs of power back and forth between president and vice president. It's a constitutionalization of the tag team idea, the ticket idea that the president and vice president are going to work very closely together. Presidents are going to be picking their vice presidents under the 25th Amendment, as, um, uh, as Richard Nixon will handpick Gerald Ford when the vice presidency becomes vacant, um, when uh, Spiro Agnew resigns. And Ford, in turn, will pick Rockefeller um, when he, um, Gerald Ford, becomes president. Uh, this is a kind of textualization of the idea that the in the political parties, what's emerging is a tradition that the presidential nominee handpicks his running mate. That wasn't so clear for much of American history, but it's, it's more clear today in political party practice. And in the text, there's this close working relationship between presidents and vice presidents. Presidents basically pick their running mates. Their running mates often succeed them. They're their wingmen. Um, and they can hand off power back and forth in cases of, um, uh, of an anticipated disabilities, let's say a planned surgery or something like that. Um, and um, one of the big areas of vulnerability, if all of this is true, we're going to talk in later lectures about whether the other rules of presidential succession, the statutory rules, make sense. Does it make sense um, if you really want presidents to hand over things very um, easily to the next in charge? Does it make sense that after the vice president, the next person in the statute is the Speaker of the House, who might be a member of the other party, rather than, say, the Secretary of State, who'd be part of, of the same presidential administration. In other words, um, does it make sense if something happens to both Ronald Reagan and George Herbert Walker Bush at the same time, you know, would it make sense to have, uh, to, uh, if something happened to these two Republicans, have Democrat Tip O'Neill take over rather than a Republican Secretary of State? If something happened to um, uh, Obama and Biden, would it make sense for Boehner to take over rather than, say, John Kerry? That's something we're going to come back to in later lectures. The 26th Amendment, um, which is also um, is also a, a product, it seems to me, of um, our, our great themes of, uh, of, of race, democracy, and national security. The 26th Amendment says that 18-year-olds get to vote. Um, uh, and um, they have a constitutional right to, to vote, not to be discriminated on grounds of, of youth. Uh, and a um, couple of things. One, um, uh, Young ad, uh, adults are m uh, actually, in America, in recent history, have been more likely demographically to be non-white. So, so this is actually um, an amendment that brings more non-whites into the process proportionally, just as getting rid of poll taxes has a racial um, um, a, 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 a effect that's racially inclusionary. Um, it's an expansion of democracy. Both political parties actually are, were in favor of it. So both parties were sort of competing for the young American vote in the way that they earlier competed for um, the woman's vote or, and were competing for the, the black vote in the middle of the 20th century are now competing for the Hispanic vote, swing constituencies. And what's the larger story? Obviously Vietnam. If 18-year-olds are old enough to 
fight and die in Vietnam, to be drafted even against their will to find that, then they're old enough to vote on whether we should be in that war in the first place. So thought Barry Goldwater, Mr. Republican on the right, um, and you know, Richard Nixon, a Republican president, and Democrats on the left. It's a story uh, that we've seen over and over again, connections between national security and democracy. If you're old enough to fight, you're old enough to vote. Just as at the founding, if unproperty people could fight in the American Revolution, and they did, as you know, loyal militiamen and, and sailors at, at places like Lexington and Concord and Bunker's Hill and Washington's army and, and on the high seas, if unproperty people were, you know, um, uh, we were willing to take them and, and have them fight for the patriot cause, they should be allowed to participate and vote in this new system. And after the Civil War, if black men could risk their lives and limbs um, for the Union, they should be allowed to, to vote. Um, and, and that's the 15th Amendment. And we, we saw that dramatic picture. Um, if women are really part of the, um, uh, the economic um, uh, support structure for um, our, uh, our wars as they were in World War I, um, they should be allowed to, to be equal voters. Young adults, if they are fighting and dying in Vietnam, risking their lives and limbs, they should be allowed to vote on that thing, on that war and everything else. So um, the 27th Amendment, I'm not going to say a lot about. It was proposed, actually, in the founding era, and it gets ratified you know, 200 years later. Um, it's a, an amendment that says that congressional pay changes, especially congressional pay increases, can't go into effect until there's been a new, an intervening election. Um, so it's a pro-democracy amendment basically saying certain things should, shouldn't happen until the people weigh in. It's a smallish amendment, a kind of tweak. It's kind of interesting just because it was originally proposed by James Madison, uh, passed the House by two-thirds, the Senate by two-thirds. Not enough states ratified, but eventually, um, 200 years later, enough states did to put it over the top. Um, the story is told in more detail in the book. What I want to end um, uh, my lecture today uh, uh, with, um, before I talk about this picture, remember we're always talking about pictures, is the 28th Amendment. And you say, what? 28th Amendment? What 28th Amendment? Exactly. Our Constitution, the, the end of the Constitution, in my view, isn't the 27th Amendment. It's the vast creative white space after the 27th Amendment. Remember, we keep adding amendments. Um, in textual order. The Constitution always has a kind of unfinished look to it. We don't word process it and stick and, and, and rewrite the thing start to finish so it looks complete. It always looks kind of incomplete. Why 27 rather than 28 or 29 or 37? So the most interesting question is what's the next amendment going to look like? And the amendment after that, the amendment after that, that is a question for, for our generation and our posterity. It's a question my fellow citizens for you to ponder um, what amendment would fit the story that we've been telling, that would, would be a, suit, a suitable next chapter to this epic unfolding American saga. And with that, I think we come to kind of where the written constitution ends and the unwritten begins. One idea of an unwritten constitution is the constitution still to be written, the amendments of the future. Um, and, that, and the 28th Amendment is, I think, one way to really think about what is this story thus far? Um, what has been done? Um, what remains to be done that would be fitting um, uh, as part of this extraordinarily intergenerational project? Because remember, the Constitution is not just about the founding. It's uh, about the amendments as well, and those amendments are on, you know, that, that possibility still continues. Um, earlier generations made amends for the sins of the fathers, their pro-slavery aspects, for example, the original Constitution, and this generation can do the same. It's up to us. We will talk about that a lot over the second half of the course when we talk, actually, in rather great detail about the unwritten Constitution. Um, uh, but um, for now, I just want to close this lecture um, with this picture. This is a picture of the March on Washington in 1963. And Note how it's a continuation, really, of the story we've told thus far. We began chapter one with the preamble, we the people, ordinary people getting to decide how they and their posterity would be governed, getting to vote, getting to deliberate, discuss, participate. Extraordinary. Um, and then we had 
images of freedom of speech and debate in, in the early Congresses. Henry Clay speaking with Daniel Webster and John C. Calhoun and, and the gallery listening. And then we, ta- we talked about how in the Civil War, um, uh, black men risked their lives and limbs for the Union and in the process won the full rights of political participation, not just freedom with the 13th Amendment, but civil equality in the 14th and voting rights in the 15th. And then we saw in the last chapter um, women taking to the streets and demanding full and equal justice, demanding suffrage rights. Um, and, and the story continues here with a, another group of Americans taking to the streets to demand freedom um, and um, an end to bias, um, equal rights now, integrated schools now, an end to police brutality now. Um, some of the demands, you see, they, they, they're almost ripped from the headlines. Some of the same issues uh, are the issues of of. 2013. Um, I'm actually giving this lecture um, uh, uh, at at a time um, uh, of the 50th anniversary, really, of the the March on Washington. This was 1963, 50 years ago. Um, uh, and, uh, um, And that story, ordinary people taking to the streets, appealing to their fellow citizens. This is where Martin King gives that famous I have a dream speech. This is the day which he he does that. And both Republicans and Democrats are marching, blacks and whites, men and women, Jews and Gentiles, gays and straights, not as many openly gay, but some of the people actually in charge of this march were, in fact, um, gay, we now know. Um, And um, they spoke. Americans listened. The result of, of this taking to the streets will be epic constitutional achievements, some statutory, some in the case law, like the Civil Rights of six, Act, Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, landmark Warren Court opinions um, on just some of these issues. We will talk a lot more about some of that in the second half of this course as we explore America's unwritten constitution So I hope to see you for that. Stay tuned. The original Bill of Rights. You're probably thinking about cases involving state and local governments. Uh, You're thinking about New York Times versus Sullivan, or Miranda versus Arizona, or Lawrence versus Texas, Griswold versus Connecticut, none of those, strictly speaking, is a Bill of Rights case. Every one of those is a 14th Amendment case, a case in which a state was uh, claimed to have abridged um, uh, a fundamental freedom of Americans, a state or locality. Now, from the begin at the, at the founding, James Madison actually worried that states would misbehave when he actually proposed a Bill of Rights um, or early amendments to the Constitution in the first Congress, he had an amendment that said no state shall, but he didn't get the votes for it. Because in the wake of the American Revolution, with a lot of states' rights, anti-federalist sentiment, um, uh, um, very powerful at that time, a lot of Americans were fearful of the central government um, and thought they could trust state governments. Remember, the American Revolution was fought by local governments against an imperial center, and the Bill of Rights reflects that American revolutionary anti-federalist states' rights sentiment. Remember, it begins, Congress shall make no law, and it ends with the Tenth Amendment reaffirming the idea of enumerated powers of the federal government and reserve, reserve powers of, of the state. So the original Bill of Rights, anti-federalist to some extent, protecting rights only against the federal government. Madison wanted more, but he couldn't get it at the founding. But the Reconstruction generation did get it. John Bingham, the the main drafts person of the key section of the 14th Amendment, was able to accomplish in the 1860s what James Madison, uh, an earlier congressperson, was unable to accomplish in the 1790s. So, So the amendments loom so large for us. If you think the Bill of Rights is important, then um, I suspect that what you really think is important is how the Bill of Rights has come to apply against the states. 
Because in fact, before the Civil War, even though the, the, these early amendments were on the books, they weren't vigorously enforced by courts. Congress passes a sedition law and courts make it a crime to criticize the federal government. It says, Congress shall make no law abridging free speech, Congress made a uh, freedom of the press. Congress made such a law and courts enforced it. Supreme Court justices put men in prison for criticizing the government. And they, um, um, so the Bill of Rights didn't mean so much on the ground until... Um, the only the only Bill of Rights case that the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court before the Civil War um, uh, had no guarantee whatsoever that um, uh, people would be allowed to vote equally, um, uh, regardless of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. The framers said nothing about equality of voting rights, um, uh, regardless of race. The Reconstruction generation, the amenders, added that. 15th Amendment. Without that amendment, I think it's just unimaginable that someone like Barack Obama could be present. There's something like the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which we'll talk about in later lectures, could ever pass. So George Washington is absolutely central to our constitutional vision. We'll talk a lot about Washington's particular constitutional vision in later lectures. In fact, there will be two lectures devoted just to Washington's vision, and he's on the $1 bill, and, 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 and rightly so. Um, and uh, he embodies national security and NGO strategy, and he he is pro-slavery, although um, in that he's a slaveholder and he dies a slaveholder, but he, at the end of his life, is trying to move away from, from slavery. And, and, and that is one of many, many things to be said in favor of the greatness of George Washington. But Washington will give way to Jackson, another general who can beat the British, embodying national security, but now in a much more aggressively pro-slavery way. Washington wanted to end slavery Jack, at the end of his life. Jackson never said anything like that. Um, much more pro-slavery puts Roger Tawney on the court. And he is, Jackson is, the most important figure in antebellum America. And he's going to give way eventually. And that system fails to Abe Lincoln. So you got the $1 bill, George Washington, you got the $20 bill, Andy Jackson, but, but the $5 bill, Abe Lincoln, we today live way more in Lincoln's house than in either Washington or Jackson's or Thomas Jefferson's, James Madison's for that matter. We live in a house that was divided against itself because of slavery, that fell because of slavery call that the Civil War, that got rebuilt, that house, reconstructed, if you will, by Abraham Lincoln's generation. So we live, I would argue, far more in Lincoln's constitution than, um, uh, than we have understood. Um, that's the generation that rebuilt the Bill of Rights, in effect, and applied it against the states and promised equality, civil equality for all racial enforces. The Bill of Rights against the federal government is the preposterous ruling in Dred Scott in 1857 that when Congress prohibits slavery in the territories, when it basically says, don't bring your slaves here. If you do, you'll lose them. Keep them out of the territories. You can keep them where they are, but don't bring them into these territories. These territories are free soil. Dred Scott said that law violated the Bill of Rights. That law was unconstitutional. Uh, um, why? Because it it violated, it was a deprivation of property without due process of law, said the Taney Court. But that's preposterous because the law was passed by Congress and enforced by judges and juries. That is due process of law. That's, that's fair procedure. Um, but the Fifth Amendment says, and the Fifth Amendment surely says due process, and it says the federal government can't violate due process. That phrase comes from England. And England has always had the rule that you can't bring slaves onto English soil, that if you do, you'd forfeit them. That's the land of due process. Due process was always understood as consistent with prohibiting slavery. But that's the only enforcement of the Bill of Rights um, against Congress in the antebellum period, the pre-Civil War period. The Bill of Rights today means a lot. It's, it, it's in a part of every... Americans' daily life and part of your, your consciousness because of cases, basically, much later cases, applying the Bill of Rights against state and local governments. And that's because of the 14th Amendment. Uh, a later generation will put differently. Today, 
we believe passionately in equality, equality of persons, of black and white, male and female, uh, Jew and Gentile. The Framers' Constitution did not emphatically embed that equality idea. The Declaration of Independence had lofty language, drafted by a slaveholder, interpreted differently by different people, but not quite binding law. The 14th Amendment puts that word equal in the Constitution in connection with individual equality, equality of all persons. Um, the original Constitution talked about equality of states voting in the Senate. E um, each state gets an equal number of votes, namely two in the Senate, but had nothing about equality of persons. That's a 14th Amendment uh, textual commitment, not a founding era textual commitment. It's all about the amendments. Um, look who's president today, Barack Obama. Barack Obama doesn't get elected president under the founders' rules, which were pro-slavery in some very important ways, advantage the slaveholding South Welcome back. We're in the middle of our discussion of the amendments to the Constitution. You hear a lot about the original intent and the framers, um, but just think for a moment about how significant the amendments are to, to, to your life, to our collective life. Um, think about the Bill of Rights, uh, freedom of speech and freedom of the press, free exercise of religion, uh, right to uh, counsel, and, and so on. Um, those rights are parts of the amendments to the Constitution, not the, found, uh, not the original document. And you might say, well, they're still part of that founding moment, that founding era. Uh, true enough, although even then, note that the very, thing, the very phrase, Bill of Rights, was not the, the phrase that appears uh, in the document itself or that was common um, at the founding period, at least uh, in official references to these early amendments in places like Supreme Court cases. Uh, the Supreme Court doesn't start referring to these early amendments as the Bill of Rights until after the Civil War and because of the Civil War, because during the Civil War and the amendments, the next generation of amendments, people talked a lot about the Bill of Rights and described the early amendments as a Bill of Rights and th way more important than, than merely describing them as a Bill of Rights the framers of the 14th Amendment, after the Civil War, a much later generation of Americans, insisted that that Bill of Rights apply against state and local governments, what lawyers and judges call incorporation of the Bill of Rights against the states. Remember, the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law abridging free speech and free press. But what happens when states try to shut down free political discourse about, for example, slavery? That's not a hypothetical. That actually happened in America in the antebellum period. Sh sh states tried to shut down uh, political discussion made the crime to be anti-slavery, a member of the Republican Party, put preachers in the pulpit in prison for preaching against slavery. So not just free speech and free press, but free exercise was uh, threatened by um, this regime. When you think today about the most important Bill of Rights cases that, that come to your mind, I suspect you're actually, strictly speaking, not thinking about um, the equality even in the franchise. That's the modern world that we live in, and it's a world of the amenders. So um, founding fathers, yes, we spent a lot of time talking about their vision. That's what all the early lectures were about, their vision. But I don't want you to forget that our Constitution is an intergenerational project, and you have to take seriously the amendments as well as the original founding vision. Now, in that spirit, uh, in the remainder of this lecture and in the next one, I'm going to talk about the next great wave of amendments. We've talked about the Bill of Rights. We've talked, uh, and uh, the 11th and 12th Amendments at the founding. We've talked about 13, 14, and 15 after the Civil War. Um, now let's talk about the next cluster of amendments, um, uh, especially the 16th, 17th, and 19th Amendments. Now, you may have noticed that the amendments come in these generational spurts or clusters. There's the founding era, um, uh, generating the Declaration of Independence and the original Constitution and, um, and the first 10 amendments and 11 and 12. 
and then nothing for, fifth, for more than a half century, nothing after the 12th Amendment in, in early in, in, in Jefferson's administration, nothing for a half century, then this cataclysm of civil war and reconstru- reconstruction generating 13, 14, and 15, so the, the next generational spurt, then nothing again for another half century, basically, and then another generational spurt, 16, 17, and 19, most importantly. And uh, I'm going to spend the rest of this lecture just making the case that, again, our modern world owes a great deal to the amendments, that the 16th, 17th, and 19th amendments are huge features of your constitutional world today. The founders, a lot of founders said, well, the federal government won't do very much. Um, uh, Most of the things will be done by states. And today, the federal government does lots. And some people, some of my friends in the Tea Party think that that's somehow improper, illegitimate, and, and not constitutional. And I say to my friends in the Tea Party, well, take another look, because it's not, the Constitution isn't just the founding. It's a series of Amendments and the amendments are nationalizing amendments after the Bill of Rights. Remember, yes, the Bill of Rights begins, Congress shall make no law of a certain sort and ends with the 10th Amendment, but the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments all end with the words, Congress shall have power, each one of them, reflecting the nationalism of the Civil War as opposed to the localism of the Revolutionary War. So these amendments after the Civil War codify that nationalism. Congress